but thank you all for coming. It's a lovely group. We're starting a few minutes late because I'm Lawrence Cohen. I direct the Institute for South Asian Studies. I've just come from teaching, so I'm catching my breath. But I Institute for South Asia Studies, which means uh, not only the largest country, India, but in fact all of South Asia. And, and and this is an important introduction to Dr. Santita Saxena because if we are a South Asian institute, it's largely due to her. And we have now uh, a center for Bangladesh as part of the institute. Um, she's one of the main faculty at Berkeley who work in Bangladesh. She works in Sri Lanka. She's the, the main scholar at Berkeley who works in Sri Lanka. She works all over. She, uh, she works in Cambodia. Um, um, she just wrote a book, which is in part the occasion uh, for today, made in Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Sri Lanka. You read the labor behind the global garments and textiles industry, which just came out. She has been giving talks um, uh, far and wide on this book. We're very delighted to have her today. Dr. Saxena did her PhD in political science. Her focus was comparative political economy. 2002 from UCLA. Before that, she was at UC Davis. She's not only global and all South Asian, she is also eminently Californian. <laughs> and um, we, uh, before coming here to be um, the vice chair and then the uh, executive director of now the Institute of South Asia Studies, she was assistant director of economic programs at the Asia Foundation, uh, and where she uh, co authored another uh, book, The Phase Out of the Multi Fiber Arrangement policy options and opportunities uh, for Asia. She continues to serve as a consultant. She's got an Asia Foundation. She's taught courses in many fields. Um, she serves on many boards. Uh, she not only uh, writes books with both an academic and a policy focus, but she's a public intellectual. And she's that rare Berkeley intellectual who's had pieces appear on the op-ed page of the Times, very influential pieces. When the ambassador of Bangladesh came recently to speak to us, he had a bone to pick with her because, in fact, Sanchita got through to ambassadors, and her writing uh, is read by ambassadors. And and it's uh, we're extraordinarily lucky to have her at Berkeley, Dr. Sanchita. I have no authority. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for that uh, very generous and kind introduction. Um, thank you all for coming. I know it's been a busy week. It's certainly been a busy month here at the Institute. Um, and so it's great to see all of you here. Um, so it is a bit, I, I guess, exhilarating and terrifying at the same time, being in this room but on this side of the podium. But of course, I'm thrilled to be here. And I can think of no other place I'd rather be to launch the book, um, the Institute previously the center, has been my home for the last eight years. And it was about five years ago at a conference um, that I was attending as part of this role when I uh, talked to a publisher at Cambria Press. And they were very interested in the book. And that's when the ideas for the book came about. Um, it's been a real privilege to work with Professor Lawrence Cohen, Professor Raka Ray prior to him. Um, both who've been just wonderful colleagues, excellent faculty directors, but most importantly provided you know, the, really the space and the support that I needed to take on a project like this. As many of you know, this is a huge undertaking, much bigger than I also realized. And of course, those of you who are familiar with the Institute know very well my colleagues, Punita Kala, Manali Shet, Previous to her, Benaz Raufi, our student assistants, Chris Yoder, Nina Gupta, who are just an incredible team. And because of them, um, I've really been able to mm -hmm. spend the time that I needed to do research abroad, to write, to do fellowships, and you know, take time off, go to DC. So I, I really, I thank them all. Um, and then, of course, my family, you know, as, as those of you know, that. Uh, Families sacrifice holidays and vacations, and just so you could, you know, finish your writing. Which, just you know, one more time, I need to spend this time and do it. So, you know, as they say, it takes a village to raise a kid. But I really think, you know, it takes a village to write a book, and maybe that's why I fondly call this, you know, my third child. <laughs> um, so I have kind of an ambitious agenda. I'd like to talk a little bit about how I 
got into this project. Many people have asked me at different points, you know, well, how did you get interested in this? Are you an expert on the garments and textiles industry? I mean, I, when I started, I really wasn't. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how I started. Uh, go through some of the, what I think are the key and sort of important, interesting findings of the book. And then kind of end with where we go, where do we go, how do we go forward? Because I think there's a lot of interest in knowing, you know, th there's been a lot of media attention about this sector recently in the last few years. Um, a lot of obviously very negative attention. And I have some thoughts about just, you know, how we can rethink um, the sector of the industry and sort of policies as we go forward. So I can actually think of the exact moment when I got interested in this topic. This was actually 10 years ago, exactly 10 years ago, in 2004, when I was at the Asia Foundation, and my then boss called me from Asia and said, the MFA is going to expire, and it's going, you know, everyone is very anxious about it, and it's going to wreak havoc all through Asia, and we have to do something. So come up with a program, and when I get back, you know, we're going to implement it. I said, okay, sounds great. And then I quickly Googled MFA. I was, what, what is the MFA and what is it that is going to you know, wreak havoc all over Asia, all over the world? And of course, at that point, I realized, I mean, as an aside, I certainly didn't realize I'd be thinking about this 10 years later. But at that time, you know, I, the MFA, um, it was in 2004, it was about to expire. So it was a, basically the multi-fiber arrangement, which was a system of quotas that were created by the countries in the global north to sort of curb influx of exports from the global south. So obviously it didn't only affect Asia, it affected many countries in the global south. And um, so it was at that time when I just began to sort of, you know, hear about this and learn about this. Of course I knew intuitively, oh yeah, you know, many of our garments seem to be, you know, manufactured abroad. I knew that, but I just, I didn't really know what the implications of that war and of this trade agreement. So this project really at that time, in 2004, started out as somewhat of a programmatic, um, a programmatic project. So we convened through the Asia Foundation with eight sort of smaller countries, not including China and India, um, and we brought together various groups and various stakeholders. We brought labor groups and the government and private sector and just started to talk about well, what does this mean? If the, if the quotas are going to expire, how are we going to remain competitive? So that, that's kind of how it started. Then over the years, as I started going to the region, I initially started out going uh, more often to Bangladesh, and I started seeing some very interesting changes. Just as I, I, was, I was talking to people, whether it was labor groups or whether it was owners of factories, even politicians, and I think it was maybe the social scientist in me that kind of said, you know, there's something interesting happening here, but it didn't seem like people were really writing about that much or talking about it. And so it was at that time, a few years later, when it seemed like this would be a very interesting intellectual and academic project. You know, several questions started emerging. And although I'm not, I mean, at that time, I certainly wasn't an expert on this industry, what I was a somewhat of an expert on, what I was familiar with was the role of interest groups and how interest groups work with one another, how they work with the state, how they work to implement policy, how they work to derail reform. That's kind of the background I came from. And, and the more I looked at this industry, that's what the story started playing out to me. It started becoming a very interesting question about various interest groups, how they're working together or not, and how they were going to impact changes in the industry. And then, Along the way, as I was worked on this, it became op it, there became opportunities to engage in various very interesting policy debates. So recently I gave a webinar to about several hundred um, industry specialists who focus on corporate social responsibility. And they were really interested in some of the findings of the book and how that was going to impact some of their decisions going forward in terms of labor issues and supply chain issues. Um, and as, as Lawrence mentioned in the introduction, you know, through op-eds, but also through other interviews, blog pieces, I've been able to engage in debates about the whole issue of current, issue, current trade distortions, like the extremely high tariffs that these countries face and sort of the impacts on labor conditions as a result of these tariffs or the 
reneging of certain status after, for example, the Rana Plaza disaster, but what are the real implications of that? So it really, this project has really been um, so many things for me, and it's really allowed me to sort of develop all, you know, various types of interests. So the methodology for this book is a combination of so various sort of qualitative and quantitative methodology. So a combination of did a number of interviews um, in all three countries, more than 100 with, with various groups, um, you know, sort of stakeholders, for a lack of a better term, um, labor NGOs, trade unions, government ministries, employee, employer federations, owners, middle managers, buyers, whole m large number of groups, large number of stakeholders, and focus groups with um, workers in each of the countries. These were very, um, very eye-opening and very, that uh, part of the research I think was the most rewarding. We did a lot of um, sort of formal focus groups, but some informal also. I mean, in Bangladesh I had a great experience with many workers who lived across a factory. Um, they all gathered in someone's home and they were just eager to just talk about their experiences. And in Bangladesh, it was a, a bit easier in some sense because I spoke the language. So autumn, initially, I was able to gain the trust, you know, very quickly. But even in all three countries, you know, we had interpreters, and it was. Um, I think those were really some of the most rewarding kinds of uh, experiences in the research. And then we did some quantitative surveys. Just the idea of this was to just grasp general trends, and we asked very focused questions about. Um, about the policy networks and the domestic coalitions, sort of the main, you know, what I was looking at. How did how did they feel that they were able to influence change? How what other groups did they work with? You know, they were very focused questions, just to get some sort of overall trends in the few countries. The research was overall, as I mentioned, you know, it was very interesting. It was very challenging in some sense because workers, for the most part, once you, once they, you sort of gain their trust, they were very eager to talk. Um, oftentimes, I mean, as those of you who work with marginalized populations as part of your research, you know that often things are written about them or, you know, for them, but it's rarely that their voice is heard. So they were very eager to talk. It was, um, I, I did wish that we were able to talk to more international buyers. That was, you know, we, we talked to as many as we could, but international buyers are very, you know, over-researched. They're sort of, they face research fatigue and they're very reluctant. It's very hard to talk to them. And the other, you know, there's two other issues, and that will come up later in the talk. One is that, you know, the, the, the research does focus on the registered factories in all three countries. And that's certainly, a, you know, I, I'm acknowledging that right away because that's certainly a gap. I mean, especially in Bangladesh, you know, the whole informal sector and the subcontractors, it, 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 it's a complete different picture. So I will talk about it, that at the end. But this research really does... <coughs> I think it's valuable because it does document some serious changes that have occurred in the formal sector, and I think that has implications for the subcontracting industry. But you know, we we were just very limited by you know working only with registered factories, so the formal factories. The other sort of challenge was with this writing this book was that a lot of things were happening literally as I was writing. So you know, the unfortunate tragedy of Rana Plaza took place um, as I was sort of almost finishing up the book. And so I you know, got an extension and made sure that I was able to address it. In the conclusions, unfortunately, there was not time or room for analysis. I and mean, things are still unfolding you know, even now. And I'm sort of following it closely. But it's hard to find, you know, it was hard to really analyze the implications of post Rana Plaza how you know how the brands were going to deal, what was going to happen to these countries, because it was literally unfolding. So the moment in 2004 that I said was a critical time because the MFA, which was established in 1974, was finally phased out in 2005. And most studies that were conducted prior to 2005 basically predicted that once the quotas were lifted, many of the quote-unquote smaller countries, basically not China, not India, would drastically lose market share. And the prime reason for this pessimism was really that the notion that various groups would never be able to work together to make the necessary changes that would be needed for the sector. And the subtext was that these groups would be too focused on their own interests, and they would not want to compromise their intimate relationship with other powerful players. 
Now, in contrast to this conventional wisdom, I mean, there was a lot written about that time in the policy uh, literature and the academic literature. Um, the earlier publication that I did out of the Asia Foundation, we were one of, I think, the first or few <coughs> Um, groups to actually say, no, it's not going to be such a disaster as you think. You know, not everyone is going to China. Of course, we didn't expect Bangladesh to become the second largest exporter after China, but we, we didn't think it was, you know, such a disaster as they were predicting. But, the, so some of these, uh, you know, unexpected, quote unquote, unexpected countries like Cambodia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, they not only survived the MFA, but they continued to make significant improvements would basi basically allow them to maintain their foothold in the garment and in, in the international trading regime. So as you can see here, I mean, most of these countries, this is just the difference between 2005, 6, and 2004, 5, and just the percentage change. I mean, for the most part, it did not dramatically fall as, as, was, as everyone had predicted. And so in Bangladesh, as I started going there early on, I started to see the beginnings of these cooperation, this cooperation between these groups, and later what I would term, you know, begin to call domestic coalitions. And I actually went into the other two countries as a comparison, kind of expecting to see that I assume that naturally these countries tend to have better factory conditions when, than compared to Bangladesh. That was just kind of the common knowledge. And it, it automatically meant that the coalition <laughs> the domestic coalition would actually be much stronger. But what I found was very different, and I'll, and I'll talk about that. So the book presents a very different perspective on the garment and textiles industry. And it highlights that an industry that's fraught with competing concerns can, in fact, collaborate and work together when it's in the interest of both the state and the interest groups to do so. So basically, this study recognizes the role of both the state and the interest groups. It's not just looking at interest groups, and it's not just looking at state, state, the state pushing change. And it argues that they're interlinked, and they require one another for sustainable reforms. So this, analyzing the garment and, and textiles industry in this way, it includes the possibility for change and resistance from a vantage point of cooperation amongst key groups rather than only contention. And the book uses the established policy networks theory for a framework, which has traditionally been really only applied to the US and European nations. There is some literature that has emerged that it's starting to use this framework for countries in the global south. So the kind of the stages of um, development into a network, you know, sort of very, if we want to simplify, um, starting sort of with an international trigger, in this case the expiration of 40 years of quotas, expanding the network as a necessary response to this international shock, the changing role of the state in terms of responsiveness to other groups, increased mechanisms for dialogue among stakeholders, and then the policy changes that impact the sector. So kind of a very simplified way of, of explaining um, you know, this approach. So just to talk about um, four kind of interesting key findings, and I'll try to talk in more detail about the last two, because I think, or the last three, because they're the really interesting ones. The first is that the changing role of labor in the coalition is significant. So this is something that, while I argue that compare, Bangladesh compared to the other two countries, actually, which is counterintuitive, actually has a much stronger domestic coalition than the other two countries. In all three countries, the role of labor has really changed um, in, the, in the last you know, decade or so, even though the strength of the coalition j does vary. It, it's, I, I argue it's actually weaker in Cambodia and Sri Lanka for other reasons. There are various channels and mechanisms that are essential to ensure representation of the various groups. So I'll talk about two. I'll talk about the private sector organizations and then the representation of labor and labor interests. And one key here is that you know channels and mechanisms just simply being in place are really not enough. They have to be credible and they have to be viable. And I'll use the example of the private sector organizations to show what that means. Simply having an organization in place is not enough to necessarily you know provide a channel to ensure representation. The third. I delink the concepts of improved worker conditions and worker empowerment. This was a really interesting um, finding that came along as I was doing the research. Again, as I said, I started from really I, I was starting from Bangladesh, so I was looking a lot at you know you, you 
hear constantly about how poor the conditions are. So you kind of, you know, go in with a certain impression of how you think the larger coalition will be, how you think labor groups are going to be represented. But in, and the other two countries, in contrast, are really touted as you know, being a leader in, in global labor rights. Yet ironically, worker empowerment is really not present. So these are actually two very different ideas. And that was a very interesting sort of, I guess everyone has that aha moment in their research where kind of things start clicking together. And this was really, for me, that. And then finally, the last point of top-down programs to improve labor conditions, and this connects with Cambodia and Sri Lanka, they actually limit coalition building, and I've really seen that in these two countries. This has a lot of implications as we go forward in terms of program design, and I'm very interested to see, for example, in Bangladesh, post Rana Plaza, the ILO will implement a similar program to Cambodia, but I'm sort of very weary about how that's going to play out and what that's going to mean for um, Bangladesh. So I'll just skip over that side. So the various channels and mechanisms. So if we look at the role of the private sector organizations, so all three countries have private sector organizations, the BGMEA, and I should also add the BKMEA in Bangladesh. The, the, there's one for garments, one for knitwear. And these are organizations, they, they're, they tend to be heavily criticized, especially after disasters happen. You know, they're not doing enough. They're only favoring, um, the, you know, they're representing the private sector. They only focus on the owners. They're really not focusing on labor issues. In Bangladesh, what was interesting, this was something, a definite change I saw over the years of going to the country. Um, the BGMEA and BKME certainly, you know, they are a uh, red organization for the private sector, for registered factory owners. But they have taken on a slightly different role or an additional role in that they have tried to link workers' concerns with uh, the owners. So, for example, facilitating dialogue between workers and owners, management and worker training, they're now engaged, that in, in, engaged in that much more. And they've also taken on a much more of an advocacy role with with policymakers, so there, I have an example in the book um, on the Chittagong port, which has been a very you know it's been a contentious issue for many many years. They've wanted to reform. It's been very important not only for the garment sector but for you know other sectors as well. But there's been a lot of issues about congestion and then you know time, the long time it's taking to get all the products out. And that's certainly a very a, a really critical pressure that. The garment industry faces. So the BGMA has taken on this sort of advocacy role, trying to improve in other areas. So th there's definitely been a shift in terms of what they started out their mandate to be and what they've slowly started to do. I mean, they can certainly do more, but it's, it, it was kind of significant that they've, they're taking on this um, role of, tr of trying to facilitate dialogue and include workers in their trainings. The equivalent in Sri Lanka is the JAF, and they are a very powerful private sector group. They're very powerful for the private sector. All everyone I interviewed, you know, just talked about JAF as if, you know, oh my goodness, JAF is just, you know, they they know what they're doing. They are organized. They are significant. They have very strong links with the government, and they they don't really. <laughs> see their role as involving labor, um, in, involving workers. They don't try to link workers with owners. They just have kept the very strong relationship with themselves and the government. So one, just an example from um, Mass Holdings, which is one of the largest apparel factories in Sri Lanka. The private sector government and buyers are part of the network. Workers are recipients of policies, but not members of the network. And this was a very common type of response that we got when we would ask, you know, because anyone we talked to from JAF, they would really talk about how organized they were and, and how great they were at getting things done. And when we would talk about, well, what about any issues with the labor rights? Or what about any issues with the workers? You know, how are you bringing them in? And they said, oh, you know, but they're, they're doing fine. We know what's good for them, and we will, we will take care of them. You know, so that was the continuous type of, you know, very paternalistic kind of attitude. The GMAC, so this is the one in Cambodia, they are very different from the other two. They are not seen as strong or powerful at all by anyone. Really, the, the government is kind of, yeah, the GMAC is there. Um, the, the owners, the factories need to register. Okay, they kind of go through that process. But no one really feels that the GMAC is doing much for them. Nor has it been 
a productive link between the private sector and labor at all. So, you know, middle manager, for example, we have to be a member of GMAC, but GMAC doesn't act as usefully as it's supposed to. It's not very helpful. And then from a trade union, GMAC has no power to influence the decisions made by its members. GMAC did nothing to protect workers due to its lack of power. GMAC just does paperwork. So, I mean, that sense of, you know, they, they're not really able to do anything. And this was, this quote actually was part of a longer dialogue about um, an incident that happened and then this the trade unions had actually gone to GMAC for help and they said you know they were completely ineffective so this is you know I give this example to show that all in all countries this particular you know private sector organizations in place but the role that they're playing in linking and what I'm arguing is sort of really key to this domestic coalition is really how well these groups are linked together you know, it really varies. In, in Bangladesh, I think it's just been more successful, and it will continue. Where the other two, you know, there's very different priorities. Then talking about the representation of labor, and again, this is something, you know, that varies amongst the three countries. In Bangladesh, so, as you know, I think there are probably others here who know, who have studied unions in South Asia, you know, much more, or this is their, it might be your expertise. The Based on our interviews and you know talking to people and reading, inner the unions, factory level unions are very. It varies from factory to factory. In some cases, workers really did appreciate what their union leaders were doing for them. In other cases, you really got the sense that unions were just uh, again very hierarchical, very <coughs> patriarchal. Women workers were just never actually represented through a factory level union. And the, many of them were connected to political parties. So there were, you know, each time around the elections, you would have these professional union workers sort of, you know, stirring up trouble, but less about actually representing, you know, the workers' interests. What the unions in Bangladesh, the factory level unions, I think they have been successful in doing is really getting, is really making workers visible. I mean, in Bangladesh, labor is visible and they're vocal. And I think that for years, has created an atmosphere to where we are now, where labor has has a sort of a different role. But one of the things that I found really interesting um, with respect to the garment industry is in Bangladesh there are the garment worker federations, which are actually much bigger than just factory level unions. They're composed of factory level some unions, but they actually also include NGOs. They include women's groups. And actually, women are really have a positions of power and leadership in the federations. And what I'll talk about in um, in a minute is, act in over the years, as I said, I think labor has been visible and vocal. But in terms of policy change, I think it's the garment worker federations that have had more of an impact on making on influencing policy than the individual factory level unions. And then informal mechanisms is something I'll talk about as well. In Sri Lanka, so there has really been a limited role for unions. And early on, prior to the 70s, unions were, you know, unions were around, unions were common. Since the 70s, I think the, there has just been a very anti-union sort of feeling, much more suppression. Um, so instead of unions, what they have at the factory level is these employee councils. And everyone we talked to, well, of course, I mean, Everyone, I, I should say, the workers that we talked to, you know, all privately told us that these were completely useless, and they were complete. They were set up by the management in order to say that something was being done, but not nothing really ever got done. So I'll, I'll show something on that, and then they have suggestion boxes, which I'll talk about in a second. In Cambodia, it's different from the other two. So there are the, the opposite situation is that there are so many unions; they have completely become ineffective. So each factory has multiple unions. They all tend to fight amongst one another. And they're also very politically um, connected. So if you talk to garment workers in Cambodia, even though there are so many unions, they actually never feel like they're being represented or they have a voice. They do talk about, they give examples of when unions have done something productive. But they also say, well, we ourselves are not that literate, so we should have them represent us, but then they really don't feel like they've been represented at all. So this is just some, you know, from a result from the survey we did in um, Bangladesh about asking the question about what is the mechanism in factories in Bangladesh for dialogue with the. We asked them, you know, what is how do you dialogue with the owner? And one of the interesting things here was that the 
what I, and this is one of the things that I argue in the book that's a little different from the kind of the, the traditional sort of the way the policy network framework is, is laid out. I actually argue that informal mechanisms, no, it doesn't always have to be a formal channel. Informal mechanisms, in this case sort of owners just coming and talking and seeing. This has changed in Bangladesh over the t 10 years that I've been there. I've really been able to see the owners actually going and just physically going to their factories and talking to their workers and managers. It doesn't seem like it would be that significant, but I think given that owners were very disconnected at one time, now that just to go and see what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis has actually changed, I think, or impacted some of, the, some of the reforms we're seeing both at the factory level and at the national level. So the you know, factory worker, for example, says, you know, owners are listening to us more now, laws are changing. I mean, they actually see that they're able to talk to the, talk to the owners who are actually coming by. And again, this is a very informal type of interaction. It's not a formal committee or it's not a formal mechanism, but I think it's very, it's very important. In Sri Lanka, so this is the a garment factory worker in Sri Lanka describes, this is a much longer quote, but it's, it's very telling, you know, describes how the union formation happened, how the union was, was time taken away. So the factory was a part of a union 10 years ago. At that time, there was good representation of the union. Then it became inactive and management tried to bust the union. Workers from the factory approached the labor ministry to complain. Then a workers' council was elected. There are meetings, but nothing gets resolved. So this is a very um, kind of common, common feeling about the common feeling about the workers' councils. You know, so they're there, they're in place, but nothing really ever get, no, nothing really ever happens as a result of these. And one of the things that came out in Sri Lanka that was very interesting, when we asked about the most efficient mechanism for workers to influence changes, um, you know, 47% said suggestion boxes they were seen as efficient. And of course, I mean, suggestion boxes are very, very passive. You know, you put a suggestion in the box, but there's no accountability, there's no follow-up, you don't really know, you know, who was taking it into account. But the fact that these, you know, that it's, it's very interesting how management has really pushed this as, well, there are suggestion boxes on every corner, you know, you, you have to, you, you can articulate whatever you want. And so workers started saying, well, you know, this is an efficient mechanism, but they actually cannot connect any of their own suggestions to any concrete changes. So that was, that was interesting. In Cambodia, so again, as I mentioned, you know, they're very, very tied to the government. Um, the, the, they're very pro-government unions. Whoever is the, you know, the government in power really rallies and tries to get all the union members together. You know, it, it's not independent at all. So there, it's not actually a check, nor is it a way to actually, you know, influence changes in policy. So a, a worker in Cambodia says, meetings between employee, employers and employees are only held due to conflicts. There are no regular meetings. When new factories are established in Cambodia, the government persuades them into joining the pro-government trade unions. So uh, just a really quick, um, oh, I better start wrapping up before my colleagues throw me out. <laughs> um, so just really quick, I wanted to talk about, because uh, in the book I have a chapter on various policies in the sector that uh, an important policy decision or issue that was brought up um, in these three countries and, and what the result was. And I actually give the minimum wage increase in Bangladesh, the 2010 wage increase, which was very significant. You know, arguably the amount, you know, was, was not high enough, but I think that's a separate issue. The fact is that 12 years prior, I mean, labor had been, as I said, active, vocal, visible, but until 2010, so 12 years later, there was not an actual, you know, legislation passed to to um, increase the wages. And again, I don't necessarily want to talk about, you know, was it high enough, was it low enough? I mean, the issue is that the fact it was actually made as a change and it was a legislative change, why this happened, I really think the role of the government federations were key. And I think their role, so I talked to many in, like the, on the wage board, for example, and they were saying, you know, the government federations representatives have really come and they've been able to articulate and argue for an increased wage. And I think, you know, 12 years prior to not have this addressed um, 
you know, in government is kind of incredible. Given how much I think all of us kind of have an idea that this is a huge issue in, in amongst this sector in Bangladesh. So the third, um, the point that I, the third finding that I wanted to talk about here was that the delinking the concepts of improved labor conditions and worker empowerment. So in Bangladesh, in our survey, we found that 56% said that they had been given a say in recent changes. And they, we gave a, different examples, improvements in the working environment, revised salaries, changes in rules. Whatever it was, it, it was, some of them were, you know, a, a ceiling fan was put in place, or some of them was, you know, um, a daycare center was put in place. Whatever that change was, 56% said they felt that they had a say, or they were able to push for that change. But as you, I mean, as we know, historically, the conditions have been dismal in Bangladesh, although there have been, you know, improvements amongst some of the registered factors. A lot of them, actually, now they're much more compliant. I mean, they have to be. So this is a, you know, kind of the disconnect here, or this is, you know, kind of what I didn't expect. Because on the flip side, if you look at Sri Lanka, you know, the ILO is very, very much will say, well, you know, 90% of factories are compliant in Sri Lanka. The Cambo Cambodia has the BFC program, the Better Factories Cambodia, which again, most 90% plus factories tend to be compliant. I mean, they have to, the basic standards are met, that's, that's the mandate of the program. But in contrast, you know, only about 34% in Sri Lanka and about 36% in Cambodia feel that they actually have a say in making any changes into their livelihoods, into the um, changes in the factory, and then certainly at the policy level. So this, this is just a quote from the book. So in the cases of <coughs> Sri Lanka and Cambodia, such positive development in the factories have been seen as justifications for excluding labor from meaningful dialogue about further changes at both the factory and the national level. In Bangladesh, though change has been much slower and improvements have been incremental, the workers themselves have been very involved in efforts to affect changes. And then the final point is of top-down programs limiting coalition building. So Sri Lanka has been, you know, they've had this entire marketing campaign, uh, Garments Without Guilt. So this is a, a banner that's in front of um, one of the large, large factories, Brandix, and these kind of banners you see everywhere. It's, it's a national level marketing campaign that says basically, you know, buy our garments from Sri Lanka and you, you don't have to feel guilty because you know we guarantee that it's being sourced ethically, ethically and you know, it reassures buyers that clothing sourced from the Indian Ocean Island has been produced in factories that are free from child and forced labor discrimination, sweatshop conditions. That, that's basically the tenant. It's a complex monitoring program that basically checks that these factories are meeting that. Sri Lanka also has been um, the leader, really, in some of the eco-friendly factories. Um, they, this was a factory I saw, I mean, it, very impressive. It was completely, um, had solar panels. There was so much greenery. I mean, it did not look like your image of a factory. There was natural light um, coming in. You know, it was, it was a very nice factory. And so it's not at all to say, I mean, they, they have done, many of the factories have done an incredible job, really. But constantly, when I was in Sri Lanka, I kept wondering, but where are the workers in all this? So you would hear a lot about the changes that have happened in the, the, these big marketing campaigns and how they were, they were touting, you know, these improvements. But you also wondered, you know, where were the workers in all this? I mean, did they, did they have any say? Did they... You know, were they influencing any changes? There certainly, it, it's not all perfect. There was issues, for example, workers were talking about the housing issue was a big one when I was there a few years ago. But you know, they they didn't feel like they had the ability to to actually push for any changes. So, a, a labor leader, for example, says there is no real forum for open discussion where trade unions can be heard. We need a forum to discuss and minimize problems. Workers are not very powerful. But then a member of JAF says, and this is again a common, common type of um, type of refrain: "We are responsible for workers and committed to improving their conditions." And so that's where the conversations with the private sector tend to end. Anytime we talked about labor groups, we talked about well, what kind of mechanisms, you know, how can they influence policy, or are, are there ways, or do owners talk to them, or would JAF be willing to bring them in? It kind of ended pretty much with, you know, we know what's right for them, the conditions, and, and in Sri Lanka they would say, we're not Bangladesh, <laughs> conditions are, are good, you know, we, we know 
what we're doing, but we know what to do for the workers and, you know, therefore leave it to us. And that, that was the constant. In Better Factories Cambodia, in Cambodia, same thing, the Better Factories program, the ILO program that's in place. So again, this was a very interesting study from um, Stanford Law School that I actually came across as a, towards the end of writing this book, but I was really glad I did because it was a, one of the first really critical analyses of the BFC program. The BFC program has really been touted as one of the, you know, these really good programs. And not to say, I mean, they have done, I think what they set out to do initially was to create a certain level of standards in the Cambodian factories, and I think they've done that. The problem is it sort of hit its limit in terms of what, how can they improve further. And it's also the enforcement capacity has been really um, challenged. So a quote from here says, perhaps the predominant narrative of success and incremental progress has shielded BFC and other important actors from doing more to improve the real working conditions that Cambodian garment workers face today. I think that was really apt. Um, you might have seen in the news um, last few years in Cambodia, there were those mass faintings that were happening on the, on the garment in the factory floor. Recently, there's been, um, just at the end of 2013, there was series of protests which actually reminded me a lot of Bangladesh of uh, pushing for higher wages and it was very, very interesting to see actually where Cambodia is going to go because I think the Better Factories program has sort of has reached reached its limit in terms of what it can accomplish you know it's 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 reached basic standards but now I think labor groups they definitely want more they're trying to push for more and you see them more active out on the streets out you know sort of protesting the wage and it really reminded me about how Bangladesh you know, has been and continues to be. So I think I'm gonna run out of time. I just wanna quickly mention two more things. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the book is actually framed by the trade policies governing, you know, trade policies that govern global trade of garments and textiles. So it started out, the book actually started and the project started because of the anxiety that was created around these MFA quotas expiring. Now, you know, all these people didn't think that it, these countries would survive. They actually did after the quotas were phased out. But now, there are continued restrictions on trade and very, um, you know, creating sort of greater distortions. And unfortunately, I mean, this is something an entire book or several books can be written just about this. You know, it's just one, it's the final chapter in the book because I felt like I couldn't end it without talking about where we are in terms of current trade policies. So the extremely high tariffs, um, you know, revoking generalized system of preferences, GSP status as a way to sort of say, you know, we are against what happened in Rana Plaza, but actually that has absolutely no connection to the garment industry. Um, this complicated way of linking labor and human rights to limiting trade, and which I, I just find very problematic. Um, and so this is a, a great quote by Naila Kabir, who says, the rich countries of the world have a long history of preaching the virtues of free trade, but practicing protectionism when it has suited them. And with the garment and textiles industry, that's been the case continuously from the beginning. I mean, I, my beginning is really, you know, 40 years ago. And so when basically there was protectionist policies put in place in order to limit these exports. And it created these industries in these countries. Um, but now, in a way, these countries are doing well, doing well by, if you measure in terms of exports, but they're in some ways being punished, again, for doing well, um, even post MFA with the high tariffs and GSP. So it's just a really interesting, this was um, in my New York Times piece, this, this data was there. I, it, I always find this very interesting. I mean, um, if you just look at tariffs and aid in Bangladesh, so in 2012, um, the aid received from the U.S. and Bangladesh was 200 million, and then the tariffs paid to the U.S. was 600 million. I mean, that's just striking. Of course, Bangladesh, Bangladeshi owners are not paying the actual tariffs. These are, all, you know, the Targets and the WalMarts are doing that. But it has a lot of implications for the cost pressure that the, that is put on owners in these countries, and it, it's all a part of the larger cost calculation. So you can actually say that Bangladesh is paying this, although it's not literally. But it's. It's, it's very striking, this distortion, because in some ways, you know, trade is basically supposed to help with development and not, you know, you're not supposed to be extracting this much money from a country where you're providing, you know, one third of, of aid. So with the five minutes, uh, five minutes that I have, I really want to just talk about going forward. 
So mass producing garments, I mean, what what has this all meant for these, you know, especially the, the current media that we see the negative sort of disasters that have been happening. Um, in Bangladesh, the, the real issue is it's, it's, a, it's much more than an issue of compliance and a much more than an issue of, of monitoring. And it really goes to why even the most compliant factories actually go to the subcontracting sector. Why do they even go there? And so, you know, one of the things that I, I've consistently talked about when I talk to brands and companies, you know, I keep saying that you have to get away from that singular focus on monitoring. After Rana Plaza, there was two big, um, what it, there was the Horde and the Alliance, one of European brands, one of US brands, that were created basically to deal with the, you know, pose the effects of, of Rana Plaza and basically to ensure that they were, you know, doing something. I mean, how can such a horrible disaster happen and, you know, you, you being a brand not to do anything about it? But again, that the <laughs> both plans basically focus on we need to monitor and check off you know, 500 factories, okay, they're compliant, okay, we move on, you know. Some of the things they're doing are great, I mean, for example, mandatory um, fire extinguishers and fire safety measures, and I'm not arguing that those things are not necessary. But the problem is that when we're not looking at the larger picture, why these, country, why these companies, these firms, are actually resorting to going to the, going to these um, subcontractors, who are out of the purview of any sort of monitoring. They tend to take extreme risks and they tend to be in buildings like Rana Plaza that were just built one on top of the other. Why are they doing that? And this is the, the change in sort of the, the idea behind how the supply chain is constructed. And the incredible pressure, both time and price, that these owners face, and not just in Bangladesh, I mean all the countries, Without looking at that, you can monitor and monitor and monitor till your heart's content, but you are going to miss, in Bangladesh, you're going to miss an entire sector because it's impossible to actually know where all these subcontractors are. I mean, some of them are in basements. and There's no way you're going to find them. So you're not solving the problem by just trying to check off a list of factories that you've monitored. So it's a much larger supply chain issue. There are certain things that... Um, are encouraging. There's the, the, the Swedish company H&M, which after Rana Plaza, they are actually piloting a program in both Bangladesh and Cambodia, and they are going to 100% own one, of, one or two factories. So that means they will be able to completely follow what this factory is doing. The other issue is that owners often feel that they, it's the insecurity. So it's, it's, it's very competitive and they feel insecure. If we don't meet the orders in the time they say, in the cost, you know, in the amount that we need to, they're just going, you know, the, the buyers are gonna leave us and they'll go somewhere else. So it's this constant pressure to say, okay, well, we'll just contract it out to the sub, you know, subcontracting firms. Um, so some of the, you know, going forward, I mean, the, the focus on monitoring needs to change. Policies that are productive um, and not necessarily symbolic. I do want to, if I have a second, just read from towards the conclusion, just post Rana Plaza. Um, I just want to read this paragraph very quickly. The United States' recent revocation of Bangladesh's generalized system of preferences, GSP status, in June 2013, following the collapse of the eight-story Rana Plaza building that killed more than 1,000 garment sector workers, is another example of this ineffective strategy and what I described earlier. The move was largely symbolic, for garments and textiles are not covered under the GSP scheme, but it was designed to make an international statement condemning poor labor conditions. However, at the time the GSP was revoked, American brands like Walmart and Gap had not signed on to the worker safety accord that was spearheaded by European companies. Thus, the irony continues to play out because the countries that demand adherence to these core labor standards as a part of their trade policy are the same countries in which brands and retailers have created an extremely competitive structure focused on increased profit margins and quick turnaround, 
a structure that by its very nature compromises the labor standards and good working conditions that are being called for. So, and then just two other quick points. You know, I was talking to a lot, when I was talking to a lot of CSR people and, you know, just brands and companies, I was really trying to get them to think about what are the movements already in place. You know, as I was trying to highlight in Bangladesh, there is a very strong labor movement and a significant one. Um, you know, how to actually work through them or with them rather than coming up with these parallel programs. So Bangladesh is going to now have this, you know, ILO similar to the Cambodia program. But the question is, you know, are they going to integrate the groups that are already active, that are already in place, or is it just going to be yet another parallel program, one of many, by the way, that have, you know, cropped up after Rana Plaza. And finally, these sort of checking the box solutions. I have now, as a result of this, I've been butting heads with um, some of the northern, the US-based sort of labor rights groups who sort of have very fixed ideas about what should happen in these countries and how they're going to get it. So they, I had in another talk, um, someone say, you know, but the, after the court and the alliance, 200 more unions were registered in Bangladesh. I said that that may be meaningless. I mean, we don't know. You can't just simply say that 200 unions were registered and that's going to result in an improved sector and, and <coughs> workers being empowered and having a voice. It may for certain factories, but that's not just, you know, you, you haven't done your job just because you've established that. And that's the problem. A lot of the northern labor rights groups are focused on these very much, you know, it's very easy to monitor and, and, and factor, not easy to monitor, but easy to check off and say that you have monitored a factory, it's compliant, you've registered a union. These are very, these are solutions that, they, they have some impact, but they're not, again, looking at the much larger picture. And I really worry, actually, that in Bangladesh, the ILO program that is in place, what it's actually kind going to do. In fact, I think it may actually be disruptive. Um, I don't know, we'll see. So just, you know, to follow, I, I mentioned some of these already, I mean, H&M H &M strategy, they're the pilot factories, the new ILO program in Bangladesh. Cambodia is, like I said, very interesting. Um, the, the protests to increase wages. What are the channels to represent labor interests? Well, will unions be more effective? Will there be other mechanisms? These are all very interesting questions. Like I said, this, is, this research has been exciting but challenging because you know, things have been unfolding, literally, and they are continuing to unfold. So you know, maybe I'll need a book number two mm -hmm. to follow up. So, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so have you given this talk to the Bangladeshi government officials at all? Yeah, not yet, but maybe I, <laughs> you I'll keep to something tanks. You should, because it, it has a huge impact upon your farm, especially after the impact of this GS, whatever, US. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. You know, and, and I, I've talked to the IOF people after the thing, and they just want to impose those standards. But I think, and you, you also walking into the Democrat, Republican, argument in this country. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a very <laughs> political issue in this I mean that's a like I said, it's another book, you know. It, it's okay. so political, it's so fraught with I mean I could just address it really in a chapter. Uh, excellent job. Yeah. Thank you. I have a bunch of questions. I'm so sorry. Yeah. It seems like um, I was wondering if uh, you'd had any uh, time to look into strikes and if strike if the right to unionize and the right to strike is part of the <coughs> communist legacy in Cambodia, and if that's counterproductive in some ways because it takes away the incentive to talk to owners, workers, because you can just strike and, and pre pre have some protection from the law. And I want to know if strikes occur in the in this in this in this kind of economies, and um, if it's if the strikes are motivated by labor conditions or if they're motivated by more nationalistic concerns like. The way the Vietnamese workers, manufacturer workers, went after Samsung for mm -hmm. more cultural tensions between Koreans and Viet Vietnamese than, than necessarily about the conditions at those manufacturing plants. Um, I want to know what kind of crime follows these labor forces, and if you had any chance to check into gray or black economies that follow the labor forces. What do you, what do you mean? By well, Yabat, which is speed follows the trucking industry, and also mm -hmm. the and Are you talking about organized crime? Yeah, organized crime, like speed, the what we call speed, Yabat is what they call it in Cambodia and Thailand, follows the, fam 
follows the workers because how are you going to stay up for 14 hours straight um, without chemical help sometimes? Um, what is the other, the other question is, um, you know, the other question I have is, um, sorry, what, who's working in some of these uh, factories? Are there foreigners who are getting drawn into the, are they being drawn the way Central American workers are brought to Maquiladores? Um, and uh, and what kind of people are they? Are they? Is it generally fair to say that they're rural workers that are being sucked into urban centers? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I try to. I may answer just a few, and then we can talk. Sure. After, I'm so sorry for answers. for overwhelming. No, no, that's okay. Um, so in, the type of workers in all these uh, all three countries, they are m many of them are rural workers. Um, majority female. Although in Bangladesh, it's. I have to go back and check the percentage, but there are also men who work more so than in the other two countries. In Cambodia, it's predominantly female. In, in Sri Lanka, it's predominantly female. In Bangladesh, because of the knitwear industry that has cropped up last 15 years or so, there are the, the machinery that they use is heavier, and so they actually hire um, men <coughs> for that. The, there are men you know, as part of the industry, as workers. Um, organized crime, I mean, I, I don't know really I just don't, I don't have call. that information. Yeah, I don't have that information really to answer. But um, the question about strikes, I mean, why they're, a lot of the strikes are definitely tied to a very particular issue. I mean, if there is a fire that occurred and people have died, then there is a strike immediately following. I mean, that's, in Bangladesh, you see that and that, that makes labor and these issues very visible. That's how even here, I mean, sometimes I argue, you know, we only have a one-sided view because that's all we hear. And in other ways, I think it's good that we hear this because vo they're very vocal. They're very, you know, in Bangladesh, they're visible. Sri Lanka, I almost never hear see Western coverage of the garment workers, factories. I, almost, I don't think in the last five years since I've worked on this book I've ever seen actual coverage. I mean, there is coverage, obviously, in the Sri Lankan media. Cambodia, recently, I've seen coverage. And again, it's, it's being visible out there. If there's a mass strike, that gets attention, that gets covered, and then it's all over the news. In Bangladesh, you see that a lot. The, the negative of that is that that's all what people see. So when I've presented this, and you know, I'm saying, well, there's some positive changes, or you know, 57% said they had a had a say in the changes they made, and people, you know, I've had people argue and say, well, you know, that can't be possible. I mean, we cannot posi possibly see that there could be any improvements in any part of the, you know, the industry, which is certainly not true. I mean, we're getting one <coughs> one side. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question, but maybe we can talk more off, more offline. Yeah. Um, thanks for your talk. I enjoyed it a lot. I did my field work in Sri Lanka on the garment industry, oh, okay. and um, I think that it's really one of the things that you were talking about really resonates in terms of moving beyond like old concepts of of what we mean by. Compliance or monitoring. So one of the key things that I saw in Sri Lanka was the impact of the recession had affected. Yeah. Uh, so not just the quota phase out, but then right after the, that, the recession the led to retailers adopting what's called lean retailing. Mm -hmm. And so, and then when the factory level, there was a lot of change in terms of how they organize production and how what the role of, like they changed. They're not allowed to call them workers anymore. Mm. They call them team members. And mm, like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I think mm -hmm. I actually think it's interesting that 34% still felt represented, even though there are basically no unions. Yeah, yeah. And that, you're right that that actually could be relatively considered high, yeah, for, given that there's no yeah. Yeah. So I think that it begs the question: How do we conceptualize empowerment, and what do they actually mean by? all those things, especially in the context of things like lean production, mm -hmm. where the whole idea is, on the one hand, you're not workers, you're not labor, mm -hmm. like, And Sri Lanka always wants to set itself a little above the other right. exporters, right. you know, mm -hmm. and, right. and then they have impressive factories that they want to show you, and then they say, you know. Yeah, so I think the lean retailing model is very different qualitatively than the ma mass production model, yes. but yeah. actually, then that leads to my last point, which is that there are these, one of the things I heard was that buyers are symbolically sourcing in Sri Lanka or Cambodia, and then placing the bulk of their orders in Bangladesh, or mm -hmm. 
cheaper prices. Right, they get those cheaper. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they they want that pretty environmentally friendly factory on their posters, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but then they're not placing that many orders there. Um, hmm. Or almost like the subcontracting is going overseas in some ways, and the actual work is being done. <laughs> so it's all about branding. And right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I, I really look forward to talking to you more and about your work. <coughs> Thank you so much. This is such rich, interesting work. Um, the two thoughts. One is a question about methodology. Um, I don't know if it was because of this audience that you seem to focus on Bangladesh, but it seems to me in this representation, Bangladesh is at the heart of the book. And that Cambodia and Sri Lanka are interesting, in particular in the ways in which they are or are not like them. Mm -hmm. or Bangladesh is being pushed to the kind of model because they offer a kind of magnetic pull in the international imagination. So I'm just wondering what is what are the stakes of the focus on Bangladesh or what does the comparativist approach look like here? Mm -hmm. So that would be And the other is, I, just a comment, I hope you've seen that amazing American apparel ad, uh, the Made in Bangladesh, yes, right? yes. which is exactly taking up on the like buy guilt free, right? These are bodies that yeah. You don't have to worry about having been harmed. This is safe. Yeah. Um, this is this is safe garment to wear. Mm -hmm. So just as a kind of like the embodied representation of that. Ad. And right, that came right when we were deciding the cover mm -hmm. for this book, and I said, "Oh my God, don't even like go there," because that, I mean that was problematic in so many ways, right? Um, the that, that's a great question. I mean, it, the book is really comparative amongst the three. Um, maybe the way I frame the talk, you're right. I mean, to pick up on that, that it, 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 I sort of said the, the, you know, results up front, and so then I sort of go back, and so in a way, it is the other countries are not like Bangladesh, and and I'm sort of, you know, you're right. I mean, that is the way the talk was framed, but it is the book. I think is is more comparative in nature. I mean, it really goes through, um, you know, the chapters that go through, for example, all the communication mechanisms. You know, it details it for each one. It really compares. But then at the end, it's sort of, the which I sort of highlighted just for time, you know, for the talk, the conclusions are really that, you know, the sort of counterintuitive <laughs> idea that Bangladesh is actually has a stronger coalition at the end of the day rather than these other two countries, which you kind of intuitively wouldn't expect. So you're right. I mean, the way I framed it, it is kind of starting from that and, you know, and then the laying out the presentation but the book is is really comparative I mean each chapter so you know there's sort of in some ways equal attention given to all three countries you know the, the policies that I'm talking about policy changes there's examples from each country um, the communication mechanisms etc you know so it's it's more comparative in nature yeah I, I think you had your hand up yeah um, I agree with you that there have been there has been incremental changes in Bangladesh for workers rights but I think you give a little bit more uh, credibility to the uh, private sector organization BJME than you deserve. I think BJME is really not the uh, not uh, looking at workers uh, other than how workers' rights, other than how it really improves the profit. They oh, absolutely, the absolutely. Yeah. This, uh, one example of that, they want to make it efficient, so they of course, can, um, yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, and in fact, all the changes that have happened have been, and in fact, what BJME does look at workers' rights, it's only when they're taking their kicking and screaming by the international focus on it and the workers. I mean, workers in Bangladesh have been um, going on strikes, have been destroying factories, and you know, because of their, their uh, um, lack of wages and, and everything else around it. So I just wanted to find that out. Yeah, no, I, yeah. yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I mean, I write that in the book. You know, this is, has nothing to do with altruistic ideas of you know newfound ways to uh, we should improve worker rights or anything like that. But I think it was important to bring that as an example because whatever the motivations are, I think that's been a shift in what they're trying to do. You know, they're getting a lot of pressure, a lot of international pressure, a lot of you know. But I think it has changed. It has helped in terms of just being able to link these groups together and bringing in questions of labor with the owners. I and mean, I think I've seen that slowly make some impact. Whereas, the, uh, you know, and if you look at the, the mandates of the other two, um, the other two private sector organizations, I mean, they're really not there yet at all. So I think BJMA is still, for whatever reason, you know, it's doing that. I still think that's, that's something, it's significant. And it's, I think it's gonna grow. I think it's going to grow. Their types of programs are going to grow and the types of things that they do. Again, pressured to do it. But I think that's important and it's kind of, you know, in the in the larger context of what I'm what I'm saying, you know, how you have you build a coalition because you have these various ways of 
bringing these groups together, bringing these concerns out. And I think in Bangladesh, I think BGME is going to be you know, one of those those players that it will be important. But yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, it's that's nothing to do with uh, altruism or anything like that. Um, so okay, well, let me get. Uh, I think you had your hand up. Okay. Um, I, I think that uh, you, you put your finger right at the root of the problem in terms of the really the sweatshop business model which has been adopted by the international brands and which is you have these internal wars between their sourcing departments and their CSR departments <coughs> where the iron triangle of price, delivery, <coughs> and quality run up against all the pretty words in the CSR departments and then you have a race to the bottom where not only in garments, but electronics, toys, yeah. where big international brands pay less and less and less each year. Um, Walmart being just one example, but Apple yeah. does exactly the same thing. Yeah. So, but I think that in part explains why they're so keen on monitoring, because monitoring doesn't affect the business model yeah, exactly, at all, exactly. and it does give them a fig leaf or exactly. a plausible deniability, you know, they can hold up ever more elaborate schemes of monitoring the like. Exactly. Um, and don't forget, you can uh, just to say you can also you can also <coughs> turn a blind eye to the other practices yeah, happening because you yeah. can say that I'm working with a you know a compliant <coughs> firm. I'm working with firm A that is compliant. Now, whether firm A goes out to X Y Z doesn't really you can completely be you know ignorant of that right. in this model. Yeah. So, but the two other things. One of which is that the monitoring, though, actually Bangladesh is the perfect case of how flawed and totally ineffective it is. All these plants, which were first tier plants that burned and crashed, Spectrum, mm -hmm. you know, Tasmanian, Tasman, yeah. all of them had been repeatedly monitored yeah, by exactly. the brands, by the CSR monitors, yeah. and they didn't stop them. Which makes me think uh, uh, that perhaps the, you know, the H and M model is not going to work necessarily, in part because we already have experience in global supply chains with 100% production. That's the model in the, mm -hmm. in the shoe industry. And that okay. hasn't prevented yeah. Nike, mm -hmm. Reebok, and Adidas from having big problems mm -hmm. uh, in their plants. So then the question is, okay, what is the counterweight to the mm -hmm. global sweatshop business model? Mm -hmm. And I think really, you know, the worker empowerment is, is the only way, but that's a very mm, challenging prop and daunting proposition in countries as poor and, and fractured as Bangladesh or Cambodia or Indonesia. But I think really to depend on either the brands or the monitoring schemes or you know local people like BGMEA or BKMEA to make fundamental changes is not going to happen. But I think that's when I was saying you know the local movements that are taking place those right. need to be supported and right. flourish and they need you know other impacts mm -hmm. on those local groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I think Unis and then Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Lawrence, go ahead. This is great. Um, Three questions. The, the, the first, just uh, more on the comparison, is is given the importance of the distinction between empowerment and conditions, the is there morbidity and mortality? First, on the question of conditions, is there morbidity and mortality data comparatively on the on the three countries so that the conditions oh, that beyond the factory in terms of just you know. How many people their dependents die, and you know, sort of, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that data is there. Yeah. And so that, and it shows again that conditions are okay. The uh, so the, the um, so I mean, is the is the, the distinction of you make a powerful case for its analytic separation? Mm -hmm. uh, is the goal, as the last speaker suggested, that uh, empowerment is the key to a politics that? And then we're reminded of Marx's essay on well, the good thing about poverty in India is mm -hmm. it is the condition for, mm -hmm. for the nation of colonial state because mm -hmm. uh, of its its horror for the ultimate um, political and you know sort of uh, transformation of, of the Indian peasant. But it's it's um, so is that the is the political import that empowerment is the key to mm -hmm. political change ultimately? And this distinction is necessary. I guess the second question is just a thought on the point that uh, one might have. Some of one's business symbolically, for example, in, in Sri Lanka, and then a lot of one's business in Bangladesh. I think that this might extend to H and M. So is H and M is all their business going to this 100% factory? I mean, they're I just going to pilot yeah, yeah. too, just to see how it works out. But you know, perhaps it won't. It, it reminds me because I, I have an essay on in, in medical institutions on CSR a bit where I talk mm. about ethical diversification, mm -hmm. where you see companies going into multiple sites of. Mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Ethical management, you know, creating a portfolio of, of variegated 
ethics, mm -hmm. you know, you know, in, yeah, in very complicated yeah. ways, and managing that portfolio yeah. with ethical variability, yeah. and uh, which, which, uh, and then finally, when the ambassador was here, God help us, um, <laughs> his argument was that we don't really want to uh, actually put these high tariffs into effect. We just want to use this as a negative weapon yeah. in order to create policy change, to create create as worker conditions, yeah. and. Um, the, you're suggesting, I think, powerfully against that, that on the contrary, this is a very central form of revenue generation. Exactly. No, and I think that's, again, missing the point. I mean, if you're going to penalize them by putting tariffs and the entire, you know, the way the, the brands are calculating costs, the pressure on cost is great in Bangladesh, but it's even greater because of the, they know that, you know, Target knows or Walmart knows that it's going to have to pay high tariffs when it comes into the U.S. So they calculate all that into, you know, it's, it's creating that incentive structure. So. You know, that's what I mean that the argument that it's tied to labor rights to improve labor rights is actually flawed because, you know, it's not looking at the And your first question about empowerment, it's one of the things, um, you know, I, I wanted to think about more and I was, you know, pressured to finish the book at some point. But this whole idea about, um, you know, I t right, I talk about empowerment and what that means. And I talk a lot about, you know, these channels of communication and representation and what that means at both the factory level and at the national level. So I, there, you know, one chapter talks about, in all three countries, you know, these various mechanisms. I mean, there's things like committees where labor groups are represented. There's various councils, or, you know, just sort of highlighting that there are several options. Um, but what, I mean, at the end of the day, what, what does that really mean? I mean, I was, I, what I wanted to try to connect that to was that actual, you know, so I, I distinguish, I mean, the factory level is, is one thing, but at the national policy level, you know, actually having ways for labor to be represented in policy discussions, um, that's a formal sort of way, mechanism. Now, is that truly going to impart, because I, I mentioned this very briefly in the conclusion, that maybe, you know, over time, we'll see that, well, they've just become an institution and, and it's not, really empowering the workers anyway, or the workers' the workers' um, ideas are not being translated directly. Now it's because at the very early stages, um, so we're seeing these possibilities of these formal mechanisms. But now, is that going to really result in work, work, worker empowerment in the long run? I mean, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. This point in time, I think in these countries, that's what we're trying to see how, these can, how it can be institutionalized and how that can Im impact policy, but maybe over time that's, it, it won't necessarily impact workers or in, in empower workers in the same way. So, you know, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I think, again, this, there's just so many things happening. It's literally happening now. <laughs> and so the analysis part of it is, it's very hard to sort of take time and, and analyze it because it's actually in the process, you know. So it's, it's still very early on. Some of this is speculative in that way. You know, the conclusion is kind of open up a bunch of more questions than uh, were answered. When is Someone trying to um, frame this for you, essentially. I mean, there seems to be a certain kind of, um, and I'm thinking about something that Jonathan Bunty said, there seems to be a certain kind of tension in my head, and I'm wondering if you can clarify for me. So on the one hand, um, we have a situation where capital is restless, capital will always move towards uh, sources that are cheap, where labor is cheap. And on the other hand, just listening to you speak, um, it seems quite clear that there's a certain optimistic quality to your work, that you know, there are mechanisms that are you know, being put into place, cleaner factories, uh, more monitoring, that hopefully will allow Bangladesh, Cambodia, Sri Lanka to um, do better by their workers, perhaps, right? So how do you reconcile this tension on the one hand of a that you describe in the case of these three countries to some degree. Because one of the things that struck me from one of your earlier PowerPoints was that after the MFA agreement, Hong Kong, uh, was it Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Korea all saw big drops, saw drops in terms of yeah. their market share. And that seemed to have moved, I mean, the market share seems to have moved to places mm -hmm. like Bangladesh mm -hmm. and Cambodia and, and other places. And I'm wondering, by instituting some of these changes, um, have we reached the bottom of this kind of global supply chain? Is there nowhere else to go that, in a sense, we can now say, okay, truly, we have a flaw, 
these kinds of changes are not going to result in capital moving to Sudan or to some mm -hmm. other you know, sub-Saharan country in search of a cheaper product. I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering if you can help me mm -hmm. understand that this, that this might just be the end of the story, that we are now looking at the possibility for these countries to have sustaining uh, industries with improving worker rights that will, in the end, perhaps do good by everyone mm -hmm. including us. Or whether this is, in fact, just the story of this decade, and next decade we'll have someone else, maybe not you, but someone else talking about Mauritius or Sudan so, or Burkina Faso or someplace like that that is in exactly the same position. So yeah, I mean, great question. I, I think we probably won't have that because I think in the, the 40 years when the quotas were in place, you know, for better or for worse, these industries were were established in these countries. So in, in why they didn't dramatically all leave, I mean, one of the reasons was if we talk to some buyers who say, you know, we have relationships, we have, you know, we have our, you know, we, we, these relationships with these factories and stuff, we have long standing, you know, we kind of know what to expect. If, if we want basic t-shirts, we go to Bangladesh. If we want beading and high quality lace, you know, we go to Sri Lanka. We know that what each is capable of. You know, in, in other countries, like what you're sort of suggesting, I mean, you know, can it go to yet, you know, maybe countries in Africa? At, at this point, I don't think so. I mean, I think we're in a period of time where these countries established what they did for better, again, better or for worse, whatever it was created. The last 40 years created a certain type of industry in these countries. Now going forward, and I think, I mean, that what I showed earlier, and the, sort of the, the theory that I'm talking about, you know, the, the domestic coalition theory, I, or the framework, really says that because of this shock, you know, whatever that was, and that was the, the end of the quotas, which it did, was a shock. I mean, it kind of said, it shook things up, and it said, you know, we can't continue the way we have been. We need to make some, you know, changes. We need to rethink I mean, the time, I, I talk about that in the introduction, you know, the time was ripe, I think, in 2004 to really rethink the way these industries would, would function. It was not going to be business as usual, and I don't think it can be going forward. And I think this 40-year period was critical, but then the, the expiration was, again, a critical moment. And post that, now what we're seeing, I, I think... I mean, I do have, you're right, I do have a whole for sure. That's why some people are kind of like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't bear to hear any hope. But I think I see it as a, as a positive trajectory. Um, again, I mean, I'm not sort of arguing that Bangladesh is really in a great place. I mean, there are a lot of improvements that need to be made, all three countries. But I, I see 10 years later, because I, I have the perspective of 10, you know, a 10-year perspective in some sense. Um, I really see a, a positive shift, um, and I don't see that it would go back. I feel like it can only get back. And again, it may be slow. It may take decades and decades and decades to get to a point where we can say that, okay, these industries are, are you know, I mean, it's a, the garment industry anywhere in the world, no matter how great the factories, it's a difficult, difficult industry to work in. So it's, I, you know, certain things hopefully will change, and then the nature of the job is such, or the nature of the, the thing is such that it's it's a very, very difficult, physically, mentally taxing, you know, industry for any worker. But overall, I mean, I, I am hopeful that there will be these certain changes implemented, which will impact. One, just aside, as before we end, I mean, in Bangladesh, the last time I was there, it was very interesting to talk to owners who were saying, oh, these workers, they're just coming and going. You know, we can't retain workers. And in Cambodia, this is the same issue. They have these fixed duration contracts where they're trying to get workers to be, you know, they want them to just be, um, you know, fixed for a particular time. And workers are suddenly having the freedom to go to various factories. But that is a very positive change. I mean, it means that factories can't get away with just complete, you know, not giving wages and, and horrible conditions because there is some choice. There is some, you know, workers are saying, well, this factory, they're not treating me that well. They're not giving the wages on time. Okay, I'm going to go to this other factory. There may be a better possibility. But that sort of slowly we're seeing that. It was interesting to hear. I mean, of course, the owners are like, oh, we are not retaining workers. But it's, of course, great for the labor, labor, um, laborers to be able to, you know, move around and have that mm -hmm. choice. I think we probably have to end, but I'm happy gonna, to talk to you. I'm going to interrupt for a second and continue our conversations. There are several more hands outside with food.
Uh, but let's, thanks, I think this is a very